Pues hola a todos de nuevo. Estamos hoy y tenemos la suerte de tener a Julia Kefer con nosotros. Julia nació en Concord en el año 1982. Concord es una ciudad de New Hampshire y ahora actualmente está viviendo en Long Island con su pareja, Cindy Collins, y, y, y sus hijos. Ella ha publicado diversas novelas gráficas. La primera de ellas es Flesh and Bone con Sparkplug Comics en el año 2010. Y posteriormente tiene tres novelas gráficas publicadas con Fantagraphics, Black is the Color, eh, Late Waste, que aquí en España tuvimos como devastación, que fue la primera novela que publicó Alpha Comic en, nuestra, en nuestro país. Y hoy la tenemos aquí con, con motivo de, de la publicación, la reciente publicación de su último trabajo en España, que es este Visión que es su último trabajo también publicado con Fantagraphics. Aparte de ello, eh, Julia tiene un sello de autoedición que es Zuban Press, donde publica numerosos fanzines, aquí es un sello, y ella tiene mogollón de fanzines publicados que publica regularmente y que va vendiendo en eventos y otras ferias de autoedición. Y eso es todo. So after this short presentation, Julia, I would like to ask you for the seed, the origin, the German of this vision that we will talk today, this last work of yours, vision. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, please. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, okay. It's hard to say because it's like kind of a combination of a lot of different stuff that was going on with me and things that interest me. Um, I, at the time that I wrote it, uh, I was in a long distance relationship that was, you know, so there's like a lot of uh, video chat like this that, uh, inspired the conversations that the main character has with her mirror. Um, and actually, I hope he never finds this out, but uh, an ex-boyfriend of mine heard about that and he was like, well, you can't have a relationship that's just online. That's just like talking to a mirror. Uh, I love the idea of a haunted mirror. Uh, I think I am one of those people who I don't like to look at a mirror in the dark, like, because uh, I always feel like I'm going to see something in it uh, that's not really there. Like, that's very scary. Uh, and a mirror is kind of a, a cursed object inherently because it shows you something that you maybe are not supposed to see like it's not it's not natural to us to be able to see our own faces you know what I mean uh and so there's like a whole other world in there that's not not exactly the real world but that is so compelling um a lot of the conflict in the book has to do with care work, caring for people who are ill, um, and not just Eleanor's sister, who is obviously very ill in a kind of an ambiguous way, but, um, you know, also her relationship with her brother, who is kind of weirdly emotionally needy, um, and the mirror also makes a lot of demands of her that she's trying to accommodate and then her relationship with uh, the doctor that's taking care of her cataract uh, and it's kind of strange and emotionally fraught for her to be taken care of by somebody else uh, mm -hmm. and I think I find myself in that position. You know, um, people close to me have had various illnesses that I've had to uh, 
help care for them through uh, and it's really it can be isolating and it can kind of force you to uh, distance yourself from your own needs which is not really a healthy impulse like it can be kind of a way of avoiding dealing with yourself does that make sense yeah mm -hmm. and then um part of the reason that i wrote part like it's set in victorian times it takes place in america so it's not really victorian because it's not british but um uh just because i find the uh medical technology of that era really compelling. The, there's a scene, like a bloodletting scene early on with an instrument called a fleam, yes. which is uh, like the, a spring-loaded thing with blades that uh, um, that makes several cuts at once for bloodletting. And this is like right at the tail end of bloodletting as a, as a medical treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, that's like a very exciting image to me. So I really wanted to include that. So that's, I guess those are the main, the main uh, influences for the story. Mm -hmm. Now we can see in the screen uh, some pages of vision. Mm -hmm. as, as you said, it's not exactly uh, the Victorian era because it is settled in, in America, but it's a constant in your work, the um, historical amb ambient in the in your stories, and not always the same, um, the same time, but different historical periods. I, I don't know if you are interested in history as a as a I don't know as a knowledge, or is something that you do because you like the aesthetics of the um, the different times you you draw. I mean, definitely both of those things. Um, I had a lot of fun in working on this, dealing with the, like, there's a few scenes as Eleanor getting dressed and undressed, and you can see, like, all the different layers of garments, and uh, I find that stuff really just uh, pleasing to draw and to think about. Um, but I do, I have written several comics that take place in like the modern era mm -hmm. uh it's it's not that i always always have to do historical stories but sometimes uh the story works best if it's set in the past uh i think There's certain issues like, for example, the issue of illness is central to this. And so the image of, for example, like an invalid is, uh, or, or like, uh, you know, Cora is, is a, a, basically a woman afflicted with hysteria, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of like an ambiguous, like, uh, something is wrong with a woman mentally, physically, not, not entirely clear, uh, which is a, an idea very of that period. Uh, and um, it's particular to a certain time and a certain class. Uh, so in order to take advantage of that archetype, uh, I had to set it in that era. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I I can see in your work that you are, maybe I'm wrong, but the, the impression that I have when I read these books is that you are not so interested on reproducing the, the way of thinking, the of the of the people of that era, but in something more, um, it's like like a, you want to to create a, an atmosphere, a mood 
some kind of uh, concrete feeling in the reader, which has to do with the with the things that you don't completely understand. And I don't know if, if it's clear the the question, but the, the question is that if you have a, you, you, maybe you don't have a, a whole documentation of how people think and live in that era, or 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 on the contrary, you do. I don't know, but the, my impression is that you are looking for something more weird or something more related to the atmosphere of the stories more than the um, historical accurate. Yeah, no, that's definitely fair. Um, I don't, I mean, I do as much, as much research as I'm able to. I'm not really, I don't consider myself a scholar. I went to art school, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, the, what is essential for me is definitely not creating a perfectly historically accurate setting uh, because, it's it's informed by stories of that era and imagery of that era. You know, I'm obviously like really heavily influenced by, for example, like Gothic literature. Uh, but it's a story that's being written now for modern readers. Um, so what's relevant about that imagery isn't what it meant to the Victorians, it's what it means to us now. Um, so definitely I focus on things that wouldn't necessarily be of interest to people in that time period. Uh, and I'm, you know, I do, I do worry about people looking at it and being like, oh, well, they didn't have this kind of shoes then or whatever. Uh, it's hard not to, it's hard to let go of those concerns, but at a certain point, uh, I kind of have to give myself permission to not have it be totally accurate because it's not it's not the point that's it's not a book for you to learn about history it's a book to tell a fiction story um and there are in some ways making it too historically accurate can be distracting uh for example i heard uh somebody this is probably on Twitter. This, that's where this kind of dumbass conversation normally takes place. Can I swear on your show? Can I say curse words on your show? Yeah, yeah you can say. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, no, no problem. Okay, just making sure. Um, so I saw somebody, I think on Twitter not too long ago, say something about how it bothers them to see in a story set in medieval times that they have food, like for example, uh, like an apple, like a big mm -hmm. golden delicious apple, like you would have, like you would get at the grocery store. Because in medieval times, you know, apples like they're small and they're lumpy and whatever, like they look totally different. Uh, and I was like, well, you know, I understand that uh, that observation, but at the same time, if you, especially in a comic, the the if you show an apple that doesn't look like what people understand an apple to look like, it's confusing, it's distracting, it becomes about the apple. Uh, the, it's more important to get across the idea of an apple, you know, so you have to draw the apple in the way that your audience is going to be able to recognize it, not in the way that it actually was, if that makes sense, because it's for a modern reader. It's not mm -hmm. for somebody who knows those kind of apples, it's for a reader that knows modern apples. So. So sometimes too much historical accuracy, I think, uh, can be uh, distracting and confusing and uh, take away from the actual narrative. So I try not to get hung up on it. Hmm. And that's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> while, we were, while we were waiting and we were talking with Gerardo, it's one of the aspects that of our, of your work that that impresses us more is this pulsion between eros and thanatos that there is between life and death that we can we can read in all or we find in all of your comics usually and mm -hmm. and 
in this in this vision that it's like a small gothic story victorian it's quite oppressive the atmosphere that 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 you settle the story in i don't know if if it's been difficult for you to to just compress all the story in in, a, in this um, small house taking all the action almost there and with a mirror this this spectral entity that lives in the mirror i don't know these these elements of horror that you usually use i don't know how, how have you been managing for this last work of yours and <laughs> I mean, you mean because of the because of the quarantine? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny universe. It's quite oppressive. I don't know if you pretended to to make it so oppressive, the atmosphere. Mm. No, for sure, it's very claustrophobic. It's uh, the um, that kind of story, like a a lot of gothic um, horror stories have to deal have to do with that kind of claustrophobia, like of an environment that uh, has a life of its own that is difficult to get out of. Um, you know, I think you could draw a parallel to, for example, The Fall of the House of Usher. Are you familiar with that story mm -hmm. by Edgar Allan Poe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is about a brother and sister who uh, the rest of their family is dead and they live alone together in this kind of isolated, crumbling house. Um, or the yellow wallpaper is another story that's very much about like claustrophobia, isolation, and um, the horror that comes from like kind of ideating a world beyond the the confines of your environment that uh, takes on these kind of fantastical properties. It's because it's more um, it's uh, an, a psychological landscape that begins to encroach on the physical landscape uh, because the physical landscape is so limited. Um, but I wrote the book before the pandemic, I think. Let me think, okay, I finished drawing it in spring of 2020. So, so yeah, I wrote it before the pandemic. And it's funny because my previous book, uh, Laid Waste, is about the, it takes place during the bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. So I did actually write a plague book, uh, not anticipating that I would shortly be living through one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it definitely has that like uh, the the oppressiveness of being indoors all the time and not really interacting with very many people. Like, I think you definitely feel that in Eleanor's experience. And that is, is very much the experience of being in quarantine, as it turns out. Of course it is, yeah. Another aspect of your of your work that I really like and I really like in this in this book as well is the the, the scene of the surgery, the eye surgery. Yeah. <laughs> this and and in late ways is that, that the scene with the dogs playing with the hand. You know? Yeah. This quite yeah, it's a, a good time for them. Yeah, you, you don't you that. don't forget these images. Once you no. once you read, you don't forget them. So, yeah. but I don't know if, if for this surgery scene, you get inspired by the Nick, the TV show, or not? No, I've never seen that. Oh, you've never seen that. Because it's, 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 it's in New York at the beginning of the 20th century. It's a hospital and they do a lot of surgery. And they, there are many scenes. Do like they do like, an eye surgery like that? That's like a no, real not, surgery. Not really an eye, but I don't, I, I don't remember exactly that. Yeah, but it's quite it's quite medical or quite accurate. How do you draw the scene? I don't know how do you if you were well. I read a lot about um, 
well, different types of medical procedures of that era. You know, it's really interesting because it's like right around when they began to have surgeries under total anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, and also like the very beginning of germ theory, for example. Uh, so like the idea of hygiene in a medical environment was pretty new. Um, and that whole thing is really interesting to me that that um, there's a lot of you've probably seen like historic uh, paintings of you know heroic doctors performing surgeries before an audience in like a surgical theater that yeah. kind of stuff is very um, I'm just gonna say I think there's something very sexy about it uh, it's uh, so dramatic and vulnerable and powerful uh, and scary. And the idea of a doctor in that setting is, you know, somebody who has a certain amount of mastery over, uh, who, who's able to overcome by human ingenuity, uh, something as momentous and all consuming as death. Like that's incredible. That's very exciting. That's like a godlike figure. Um, let me see. But so, yeah, I read a bit about uh, from like medical manuals of that time, but the procedure that she has uh, is called couching. I think maybe it's mm -hmm. pronounced couching, C-O-U-C-H-I-N-G, where um, what you do is uh, like, because the cataract is in the, it's like a clouding of the, I don't know exactly what it's called, but like, you know, the lens of the eye. So mm -hmm. if you uh, basically just use a blunt instrument like he does here to uh, push that part of the eye out of place because mm -hmm. inside your eye it's like hollow it's all goo in there so you can push the front part the lens of it down into the goo and then of course you can't focus but you're able to see because the clouded uh, lens part of the eye is is no longer blocking it uh, so this is thing that they used to do to treat cataracts and still sometimes do in places where uh, they don't have access to more sophisticated technology. Uh, it seems terrifying. I've read that most people who have it done on one, one eye do not elect to have it done on the other eye. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that seems like it's not highly recommended. Um, not. Uh, and it, also the lens can then like drift back into place so then you would have to have it done again mm -hmm. which also sucks but then uh the doctor here offers to her also like a, a more advanced procedure to actually remove the cataract but it has a much longer recovery time uh so this is more like a stop gap measure uh that may or may not last um but they they did have more more effective surgery for cataracts at that time but like it says in the in the story it's, it was more involved which is why right. she decides not to have it and it's an upsetting idea like i obviously like i i linger on those images for a while um I've been thinking about it because I really want to have LASIK, <laughs> you know, like uh, to, as you can see, I wear glasses. Um, sometimes I wear contacts and learning to put in contact lenses is, you know, that's an experience that informed this in writing about it too, because it's scary to learn to touch your own damn eye. Like yeah. you, you, there's something deep in your brain that says you should not do that uh so it's a real exercise of will to um 
make yourself do it anyway. Uh, and the idea of having eye surgery when you're conscious, oh my God, terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, I want to do it and I don't, I cannot even begin to imagine how people endure it. So. Yeah, I will never uh, try it, but yeah. not even, yeah. Neither. Not even Neither. the contact. No. Okay, it's but scary. It's... Just one worse thing is the teeth. Teeth surgery could be worse than mm -hmm. the eyes, I guess. It yeah. is, it's true that these images can provoke uh, nightmares, <laughs> especially yeah. this, this pop in the final panel oh, of yeah. this page is especially... I don't know. It's Sadik, right? maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's you can really feel it. Yeah, it is, it is disturbing, but at the same time, there there is something in in all the scene of the of the surgery that uh, really attracts me because of this mix of uh, disgust, disgusting feeling, but at the same time, it's a very, as you said, this is a very sexy scene because. There is something right. that that is a starting. There is a relationship, relationship between the doctor uh, and Eleanor. I don't know. Is uh, there is a sub subtext in the in the scene very sexual, but at the same time, it's something that it could be. It couldn't be more opposite to sex. I don't know. <laughs> it's maybe but like i think that the uh physical pain and vulnerability um are very close to sexuality oh yes like, i don't think it's a huge leap to say that there's like a sexual aspect to this uh you know especially um the shape of the eye is kind of almost like a vulva shape. There's the way that it's held open and the penetration. Uh, and then the way that there's like goop that comes out of it. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, I hope disturbing to consider, but the implication is there. Like, and then later when she talks to the mirror about it, the mirror is very jealous. Oh like, yes. He Im immediately clocks the sexual subtext there. Uh, and so uh, last year I had um, uh, like some sinus problems and I had to go see a, a specialist who uh, I would go there like every other week and he had this like long instrument uh that he would stick up my nose which felt disgusting uh and i remember talking to my friends about it like that should it should be possible to eroticize this like if i if i could find a way to uh not be so disgusted by it maybe it would be easier and my friend said to me well uh, this person is going to be able to touch you and look at you in places where nobody ever had before. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's something. There's something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, this this uh, leads us uh, to another question which are related to the the link that we can find in your books about sex and death, because it, it's always very close to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like uh, sex leads to the to, to death, and on the contrary too. And I don't know what what on do you <laughs> yeah what, oh, what do you um, think about that yeah why, why in your comics death and sex are always so close. I mean, I don't think I invented that link. That's a that's an ongoing human problem, right? Um, 
I think that sex is very close to death in that, you know, not just because of procreation, although also that, um, but because uh, it's a way of um, losing yourself, becoming uh, undifferentiated. You know, uh, you are, are trying to become part of somebody else, become part of this like universal or near universal human experience. Um, and it forces you to be embodied, you know, like uh, present in and conscious of your body in a way that I think normally we are not. Um, I think in some ways it is like, for example, in laid waste, it's kind of an act in defiance of death uh, in that you I know we're talking about vision but in in laid waste there's a lot of like everybody is dying it seems like it would be much easier to succumb to the destruction that's happening all around. Um, but at, 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 at the risk of sounding a little bit trite, you know, sex is something that you can only do when you are alive. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of have to embrace the fact of having a body, having physical sensation and physical vulnerability. Um, in order to participate in it. Uh, and it's also, it's um, one of those few things in life that feels kind of, it can feel inevitable. It feels like the natural consummation of a relationship, uh, you know, by being born, there are certain things that your body is determined to do. And one of them is die and another one is fuck. Um, they're both sex and death profound mysteries that are, are scary and also impossible to look away from. You know, I think the feeling is very, they're like not quite overlapping, but they're cousins, you know? Okay, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. At the same time, uh, I like how you, structure your stories you have these passages that they are with no words and you just ah, we, we were talking this morning with gerardo that or your comics remind us a lot to the cinema of theodore dreyer or pasolini or you know Emma berman berman I don't know. It has a, a cinema quality. Your comic books. We when you when we read your comics, we don't we don't get we don't get uh, links to other artists of comics. We get links to cinema or literature, yeah. something like that. You are not like. Do you do you have a tradition of reading comics or or not, Julia? Yeah, not really. I don't. I mean, I have most of my friends are cartoonists. So like I read my friends' work, but um, I don't necessarily. I don't read a lot of comics like for myself. I like I like literature and I like films. Um, I think you know in in all of my comics tend to have like a, a very regular grid. 
Um, it's not, there's not like dynamic page layouts. Mm -hmm. uh, I also don't use a lot of sound effects, like uh, um, that kind of stuff. I think other people use it very artfully. For me, uh, when I use it, it always feels kind of gimmicky. Um, <laughs> And, but I think that the like regular, like it's almost like a metronome to have mm -hmm. just like very regular panels like that. And I think that gives it kind of a cinematic quality for sure. Um, I like the regular panels because it gives you a sense of the passage of time. And I like those long takes you know, that like when you stay on the same image for several panels at a time and it can feel uh, almost uncomfortable, excruciating even. Um, it feels weird to look at the same thing for a long time. Uh, and I like that, I like to lean into that. Uh, and it's, you know, it's similar in film, a long take can be really intense. Um, I think <laughs> I think about Orson Welles a lot. Orson Welles said uh, that uh, anybody can make a good looking movie with a lot of shortcuts, but mm -hmm. it, um, it's the long takes that separate the men from the boys. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I so, was thinking, I was thinking that the Dark Age, for instance, mm -hmm your comic book, you have six mm -hmm. pages, totally black. It's yeah. waiting oh, yes. for help. This is not usual. I mean, it's not so common. Yeah, it's like, it's weird, right? I, I very pleased with that, the effect of that. Um, and it's something that you can kind of only do in a comic because uh, when you encounter those, black panels. So for those who haven't read it, uh, Dark Age is a comic about um, two young teenagers uh, in like prehistorical Europe who uh, are exploring a cave, you know, like you would see where there's like cave paintings and uh, uh, they go in there together to be alone and to make love and they end up going very deep in the cave until one of them gets stuck and then the other one has to go for help and the one who has to go for help takes the lamp so the other one is stuck in the darkness uh, and when you get to that point you stay with the character who is, is in the cave in pitch darkness for I think a couple of hundred panels um, and I don't necessarily expect readers to uh, look at each individual black panel and contemplate it, although I know that some people have. Um, but more it's just the effect of, uh, you know, you get the, you see a few and you're like, okay. And then you go a couple of pages and it's still like that. And you're like, okay, how long is this gonna, like it, you, the, my idea was to give the reader the impression and maybe a little bit of fear that it is just gonna go on like that for the rest of the comic. You really don't know because he doesn't know. The character doesn't know. It might just be like that forever. Uh, it's a disorienting. Um, and I think that you couldn't do that in prose because um, you would have to have text that marks the passage of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have to tell the reader that this is what is happening is that it continues to be darkness, which is something, you know, mm -hmm. that text would still be something. I'm sure a clever writer could do it, but. Um, and even in a film, uh, it wouldn't work the same because well, for a few reasons. Uh, usually when you watch a film, you watch it with other people. 
So you would have the opportunity to look at the person next to you and be like, uh, what's happening? Um, reading a comic is a very solitary activity. So I have the, the benefit of knowing that when this is happening in the comic, it's, it's just me and the reader, uh, and the reader wondering what it is that I'm doing to them. Um, and also in a film, uh, I don't know, there would be sound maybe, uh, usually there is in a film. And again, that would be something. Um, but in a comic, they, uh, the readers supplying the sound in their mind. So there's this total breakdown of like the contrast between me as the creator of the comic and the reader and that like they no, no longer know what it is that they're supposed to be doing, you know? They're like, mm -hmm. is the comic still going on? Did, did the character die? Are they, should I still be imagining them? Like, are they experiencing this? Or, you know, it's confusing. Um, I really like it. I'm very pleased with myself <laughs> for doing that. Um, and I think I wrote a lot of, I think probably the reason that I wrote that comic is, is so that I could use that device of a uh, uh, darkness that goes on for uh, an unclear amount of time. But you know, when you read it, that it is, still a part of the story because there are still the panels. Yeah. You know that there's some kind of a passage of time. Uh, because the pages are not, they're not blank. Um, and it's not like a big black, mm -hmm. you know, there's still there's still story happening. You know, because the panels continue. Uh, in some ways horror comics feel very limited. Uh, or, or, or you have certain handicaps, um, especially because you don't have the benefit of sound effects and the sound in a horror film is so essential. Sound is really scary. Um, and also movement, you know, the way that things move in a horror film is really important. They can move in an unnatural way, which is difficult to get across in a comic. Mm -hmm. But we have advantages too. Um, and I think that the biggest advantage that we have as comic horror artists is uh, the degree to which the audience is forced to participate in the progress of the story. Um, when you're reading a comic, you are doing so much. You're physically, your eyes are physically moving over the page. You are turning the pages. Like you could walk away at any time and you don't. It's not as if, it's not like in a film where if you stop the film or if you walk away from it, it continues without you. You're, you're the engine of the story happening. If you stop reading it, then the story stops happening, um, which makes you culpable in a way. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. You're like allowing the story to happen by reading it. Uh, and I think that's really fun. <laughs> yeah, it's like that the reader is controlling the rhythm of the, of the story in a certain way. Um, that I find very interesting what you said about the, the comparison between uh, horror films and horror comics, because sometimes, I don't know if you agree, but I can read some comics that are trying to uh, translate the film experience into a comic and it doesn't work because as you said are totally different media with mm -hmm. their own rules so uh, that's that's what i what we are thinking about the relationship about your work on cinema it's not like you are trying to do exactly the same but it's another kind of more subtle uh, influence if you know what i mean because yeah, yeah. It's, it's obvious you that you much. <laughs> no, it, it, I think it's obvious that you are mm, totally concerned about the um, comics language, uh, how mm -hmm. the comics uh, works in this way. 
Um, there is another thing that is very interesting, I think, uh, which is the relationship that you mentioned about the author, the artist, and the reader. Mm. I don't know if you are agree, but uh, you agree. But I think that in, in com comics is a media that a medium, sorry, that create and a very special relationship, very close relationship between the artist and, and the reader. And this is something that the good artists can explore and can use in their own benefit and the benefit of the story, in fact. For sure, it's, comics are very, very intimate. Um, I, when I started out, I, like, I, I went to college for fine art um, and mostly was, you know, having shows in galleries and things like that, like that's where I thought of my, uh, I thought of that as my primary practice. And I started made, started making comics kind of as a side thing because when I moved to Portland, Oregon, um, all, all of my friends that I made were cartoonists. It's a very big comic community there. So, uh, and then I found that it was, I was just much better able to do what it was that I wanted to do in comics. But the thing is that um, if you have like a, an image uh, in like a painting, for example, in a gallery, mm -hmm. um, it's so public, uh, people, several people are going to look at it at once and they're only going to look at it for uh, a few seconds maybe um, or a minute you know not as long as it would take to read a book um, and even if you are even if they're looking at it by themselves even if they look at it for a long time they're doing it in a public place um, whereas when you read a book uh, you're it's 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 easier for me to say things in a book that are you know it's like i'm whispering it in your ear uh so i could be much more uh i don't know weird uh experimental um i could take more risks um, to say things maybe that I would say to somebody in private uh, as opposed to, you know, in a public place. It, it's, I think also because comics are a little bit more difficult to find there, you know, it's like a smaller, a smaller community and it's a little bit underground, the kind of comics that I make. Uh, you have to do a little bit of work to find them. So it's intimate for that reason too. Um, every time that you find a comic or a zine that means something to you, it, it kind of feels like discovering a secret. Um, I think that the uh, um, the amount of effort that you have to put into reading a comic really makes a big difference in how you experience it as a reader. And uh, also the amount of work that goes into it, you know, comics are very labor intensive. Like I write prose fiction also, nothing that I've published, but um, compared to like making a standalone image or to writing a story like comic, making a comic is just a lot of work. It's very time consuming. And it's a lot of just like, you know, your hand holding a pen, moving it on a page by yourself at your desk. Uh, and I think that you have a sense of that when you read it. Um, you know, when I draw like a, a, a scene where there's the same image repeated, you know, I don't, I mean, obviously you can tell from looking at it because they're not really very much like each other, but it's not, it's not a copy. It's not even trace. 
it's just redrawn. And I think that you can feel that when you look at it, you can feel the artist's labor, you can feel the passage of time, you can feel the amount of effort and it feels different, it lands differently. Uh, I think that handcrafted things are, are like that, like you, you feel a uh, connection to the artist in a way that you don't in other mediums. Mm. And talking about this, I don't, I think that uh, there is uh, an even deeper level in self publisher for sure, for sure. Yeah. it's more it's even more uh, intimate right the the relationship between reader and artist right definitely of course because you have to usually actually um make contact with the artist like you have to get in touch with them and and talk to them in order to get their work a lot of times or you know, however people do it now, you know, you follow them on social media or something, but um, you do have a personal relationship with them. Um, so it's different from uh, from other types of publishing where most of your contacts would be maybe through the publisher, through their agents or something. Um, I'm a huge advocate of self-publishing and zine making because there's uh, there's so little barrier between the artist and the audience. There's nobody, uh, you know, my publisher is very, uh, They basically never ask me to make changes to my work or ask me to do anything that I don't want to do. Um, they'll let me do whatever. Uh, and if I do something that is hard to understand or that is, I don't know, obscene or offensive or whatever, they'll stand behind me. Um, they won't ask me to change it. That's just the way that phonographics is. Uh, so I'm very lucky in that regard. Um, but when you self-publish, you have even like, you have so much more freedom to say whatever it is that you want. Uh, there's even more than if you were publishing it online because even the entities online that will host your work um, exercise a certain amount of censorship, um, you know, with regard to certain types of obscenity, violence, things like that. Um, and when you self-publish, you have as little barrier as there can possibly be between your own your own ideas and other people. And I think that's really powerful. I think it's really important. Um, the, the drawback to it is that it can be difficult to make money. Um, but <laughs> if it's at all feasible, I think that should not be the primary concern yeah you know as long as you can put food on the table you shouldn't think about what will sell you have to think about what is important to you and what is truthful you know yeah absolutely yeah so i guess maybe the best solution to that is to do both if you can do commercial work and self-publish your really freaky work but I think it's even better for artists if they can have like a day job, <laughs> something that you don't have to put your heart and soul into because it can be really draining to do 
artistic work that you don't believe in. Um, it's better if you can save all your creative energy for stuff that really matters to you. Just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mark, I don't know if you have any other question about the... I would like to, I, I would like to ask Julia, because you, you were talking now about self-publishing and you were talking about that you don't have any problem with your publisher, that you start publishing with Dylan Williams in Sparkler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it was an important person at the beginning for your first comic that was published. And I think that I don't know if Fantagraphics is more or less your editor in Fantagraphics is more or less doing a similar a similar role like Dylan Williams did at the beginning of your career. I don't know. I, I, yeah. I'm asking. It's like that you can do whatever you want and nobody interferes so much. But it's like like a man or someone that that helps you to just struggle and then don't they fail and no don't fall yeah you can I do mean, it anymore. honestly dylan actually did um tell me what to do a little bit but i'm glad that he did i when i first met dylan i was probably 24 and i had never made like a serious comic before i had made um Just like stuff that I, I wouldn't even do like a pencil drawing. I would just kind of draw it. Uh, uh, and it was never like an overarching plot. It was maybe like a something light, like usually dark, but like kind of funny, sarcastic, I guess. Um, a lot of it was like, you know, about me being annoyed by things at work or something like that. Uh, and he said to me, I think he called me up and he said, uh, you know, I want to publish a comic of yours, but I want you to write about something serious, like the kind of thing that you do your fine artwork about. Uh, I want you to actually plan out the plot before you draw it. And I want you to, you know, pencil it, write a script, do all the steps that one does um and I want to be 40 pages long he had like a certain like parameters for the kind of comics that he the format that he wanted to do um and because I really loved Dylan a lot and respected him I was like all right okay we'll give it a shot normally I don't take direction very well and most maybe anybody else would say it said that to me I would have been like you can go fuck yourself but uh for Dylan I did it and I wrote flesh and bone um using like a lot of plot elements that I knew that he would appreciate like there's kind of a like romance suicide uh there's like some hermetic like occultism, demonology, things like that. Uh, and, you know, because he and I were friends, I knew that he would enjoy that kind of stuff. So I wrote it for him. Um, and it just, it really came together. Like it just worked so well. Um, and when it came out, you know, I wasn't expecting it to be much of anything, but it, for some reason, it just hit like it, uh, I mean, on a small scale, but for me, it felt like a big hit. It, uh, it got reviewed in the Village Voice, which, you know, I was, this was, I was living on the other side of the country, so I was amazed that they were even aware of me. Um, it, was accepted in Best American Comics, which I guess he had submitted it to. Um, 
it was nominated for an Ignatz Award, which I didn't even know what that yeah. was at the time. I got the email about it and I was like, is this a big deal? And my friends were like, yeah, it's a big deal. Um, and people wrote reviews of it where I felt like they really understood what I was trying to say and what mattered to me. Uh, and it made me realize, like, I guess I, I touched on this before, like that I, that comics was a much better medium for the kind of storytelling that I wanted to do. Um, and I think, I think that that was not just dumb luck, like that was part of Dylan's genius. So I think he did that for a lot of artists in my milieu, uh, you know, like um, Katie Skelly or Austin English, like he posted a lot, he, he published a lot of people <clears throat> who he kind of was able to sense what it was that they were supposed to be doing and kind of like nudge them in that direction. And if you look at my work previous to Flesh and Bone and then after, like I just kind of found the thing that worked with that book and stuck with it. Like aesthetically, my comics have not changed a lot since then um, because I, I found the thing that worked for me. And I think he was, You know, he he helped me to become that. I wouldn't, I would never have become that without him. Uh, but yeah, Santa Graphics doesn't doesn't do that. Um, I think that they pretty much picked me up fully formed and just kind of said like, okay, keep doing that. I mean, I'm sure if I did something totally different, they they wouldn't tell me not to, um, but the most important thing for me with a publisher is that they, uh, they give me a lot of encouragement, which sounds oh, so yeah. silly, but like, oh, you really need it. You really need it to, to, it's so scary to make something and show it to people. Like you really need somebody that you, trust and respect to be like yes this is a good idea <laughs> you know what I mean yeah mm -hmm. yeah so well I don't know uh, we been for an hour talking right yeah. now yeah a little bit more of an hour so maybe it's okay to end here I don't yeah, know Matt I really want to go to bed huh sorry I said you probably want to go to bed Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Totally. Here yeah. in Spain is um, very late, but uh, in any case, we we would like to thank you again, Julia, for for sharing thank this. Thank you so much for having me. This is a pleasure. No, a no, pleasure. our pleasure, our pleasure. We would like to recommend your books again. To our viewers, recomendamos que, que leáis tanto Visión como Devastación, como we, we hope that the rest of your works can be uh, published soon in Spain. I hope so too. <laughs> we hope. So thank you very much, Julia. Sí, I, would, I, would like, I would like to remind the people that they are listening to us that they can go to the Patreon of Julia. Oh, yes. They can read a lot of stories in the Dark Age or Flesh and Bones, for instance, and uh, many, many short stories that they can find it also in, in the fanzines that you publish. No? The, the, the yeah, small... Flesh and Bones has a sequel that I never published in print, but you can read it on my Patreon. Okay, so did the Patreon, pay the Patreon, and enjoy Julia's mini thines or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good night. Good night.